This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. As we talk about the new Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, let's go back to the recent U.N. climate talks in Warsaw, Poland, in 2013. We spoke with Tosi Mpanu Mpanu, the former chair of the Africa Group at the U.N. Climate Change Negotiations from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mpanu spoke about developed countries' obligations to address the impacts of climate climate change. Uh, charity, I think it's uh, rather something along the lines of compensation because uh, runaway climate change is putting one billion Africans in harm's way. Today, those Africans have to go through adverse effects of a global phenomenon that they didn't create. It's actually creating not only drought, floods, it's creating conflict because people have to go further and further to get some water and other people are not just welcoming, welcoming them. So, uh, Mr. Jones, can drive two SUVs in the U.S. while a uh, poor African is fighting uh, to get some water. So it's about doing what's right, and it has to be done in two ways. To reduce uh, the lifestyles, uh, the, the, the consumption of carbon in, in the north, and to provide some resources so that we can deal with a climate change phenomenon which was imposed on us. I wanted to get the comments of our guests today, uh, Salim Haq and Michael Oppenheimer. Michael Oppenheimer, professor at Princeton University, and Salim Haq both are co-authors of the newly released Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report. Uh, we're also joined in Sweden um, by Tim Gore of Oxfam. Salim Haq in London, uh, if you can talk about the effect of climate change on the least developed countries, uh, sticking with this theme of how this increases disparity in the world. That's absolutely right. As you heard from uh, Tosi Mpano Mpano from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, poor countries uh, have been hit hardest by the impacts of climate change and are already seeing those impacts. And there's a group of poorest countries in the world called the least developed countries, which are 50 of the poorest countries in the world, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, but also in Asia, including my country, Bangladesh. And these countries are recognized to be the most vulnerable, and there are obligations that the rich world have taken on to support them and help them. They have made pledges of uh, funding, but they haven't met those pledges uh, fully yet. So that's one aspect that they need to do. On the other hand, one of the recent, uh, if you like, new outcomes from the fifth assessment report is that these countries aren't sitting idle. They're actually going ahead and trying to adapt to the potential impacts of climate change and the ones that they're seeing. Uh, give you the example of my country, Bangladesh. Bangladesh has a very far-reaching climate change strategy and action plan. They're putting in the order of a half a billion dollars of their own money into implementing it. At the same time, they're asking for international donors to match that, and they've matched it to about half that level. But the country is not sitting idle. They're going ahead at community level, at national level, at sectoral level, and so are a number of other least developed countries. So in many ways, the least developed countries are actually leading the world in trying to find ways to tackle the impacts of climate change and adapt. But there is a limit to what they can do. As I said, perhaps up to two degrees they can do it, but beyond that it's going to be much more difficult. I want to go back to comments that our Oxfam guest Tim Gore made about fossil fuels. Uh, the largest oil and gas company in the world, ExxonMobil, just released a report after the IPCC report this week saying that climate policies are, quote, highly unlikely to stop it from producing and selling fossil fuels in the near future. ExxonMobil's report says, quote, we believe producing these assets is essential to meeting growing energy demand worldwide and in preventing consumers, especially those in the least developed and most vulnerable economies, from themselves becoming stranded in the global pursuit of higher living standards and greater economic opportunity. That's a report from ExxonMobil released after the IPCC report came out this week. Uh, so, Michael Oppenheimer, could I get you to comment first on, on the Im impact of fossil fuels and what, what, this, what this means? Well, first of all, the problem is caused by and large by burning coal oil and to a lesser extent natural gas, the fossil fuels, which by and large power our society. It's rather interesting that Exxon felt compelled to make any statement about it at all. What they've done in the past is fund groups to uh, kick up a smokescreen of contrarian science or contrarian non-science to confuse the public. I think the company is slowly coming around to realizing that that won't do much good over the long term. This is a problem that has to be grappled with. On the other hand, I don't expect Exxon to say we're going to give up the oil business. That is their business, after all. The question is, 
how they're going to position themselves with respect to particular U.S. political initiatives, which will eventually happen again, like the bill in Congress in 2009 that was aimed at controlling emissions. Are they going to oppose President Obama's efforts to use his regulatory authority? regulatory authority to control emissions. Those are the key questions. The rest of it is rhetoric. Well, talking about that politics, I mean, the House has approved a measure that would effectively force government agencies to stop studying climate change. The measure calls on the National Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric Administration related bodies to focus on forecasting severe weather, but not exploring one of its likely causes. I'm wondering if you could address this and the overall climate, if you will, in the United States. You're a uh, professor at Princeton University around this uh, pushback on whether humans are causing climate change. Well, first of all, that's clearly an ostrich head in the sand policy. If you pretend you can't see it, then it's not happening. And it doesn't, isn't going to do us any good, obviously. It isn't going to stop climate change. And it's uh, symptomatic of, unfortunately, an attitude that we've seen in parts, particularly the House of Representatives, uh, there, you know, where people just don't believe in science. And that's something it has to change, or else we can never effect effectively grapple not only with this problem, but a whole raft of issues in our very highly technological society. Um, you know, what, what the future holds in that regard, it's hard to tell. I'm not the first one to point out to you that this country is polarized terrifically politically. This is a problem which, if it's going to be solved, goes to the root of our energy system. We need a bipartisan approach to solving it. And the political rhetoric and the political inaction that is freezing everything these days really gets in the way. Hmm. Uh, Tim Gore, uh, before we continue, I'd like you to talk about some of the work that Oxfam has done and its experience with people on the ground dealing with the impacts of climate change. You've spoken specifically about an irrig irrigation project in Zimbabwe, for instance. Could you talk about the impact already being felt in many parts of the world as a consequence of climate change? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, Oxfam's working in, in many countries right around the world, uh, already grappling with those impacts with small scale farmers um, across sub-Saharan Africa, um, working with them to understand how the seasons are changing, what that means for their cropping patterns, uh, helping them to think about uh, different uh, seeds, different planting regimes, uh, helping with small scale irrigation schemes. Actually, in, in uh, Bangladesh, in uh, Salim's country, um, Oxfam's doing a lot of work on early warning systems um, to make sure that fisher folk and, uh, and other people living in highly vulnerable areas, essentially below sea level, um, get the information that they need about incoming storm surges or cyclones so that they can uh, get uh, get out of the farm's way uh, in time. So uh, I think, as Salim says, there's a whole raft of um, action that is going on uh, now uh, in some of the poorest countries to try to adapt to climate change. And that's very welcome, and, um, and, and we're working on that in, in partnership with, uh, with many other organizations. But um, as Salim has also said, there are real limits here to what the poorest countries can do on their own. Um, you only have to look at the amount of money that rich countries are spending on adaptation. In the U.S., for example, I think uh, the Congress approved something like $60 billion for uh, the recovery efforts uh, following um, Hurricane Sandy in New York. Um, I mean, that, th those are the orders of magnitude uh, that we're talking about in terms of dealing with this problem. Another example from the U.S. is the amount of money, that uh, public money, that's currently being spent um, to support uh, farmers in the U.S. to deal with climate impacts or um, to, to ensure their crops. Something in the order of a billion or, or, or so for a billion dollars of public money going in to support um, the insurance schemes that, that protect farmers in the U.S. In, in the wake of losses like we've seen from the droughts in 2012 or currently ongoing in California. Now, that's, those are huge sums of money, of public money being invested by rich countries in, in their own protection, their own adaptation, their own preparedness for climate impacts. Poorest, the poorest countries on the planet simply don't have those resources to draw upon. They are investing some of their own money but they need more support from the international community, from the rich countries that in the end are, uh, have emitted most of the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And it's they that um, are responsible for providing some of that money to make sure that the poorest people who are least responsible for this problem uh, get the kinds of resources that they need to adapt. And, and the, the example that you gave from Zimbabwe is important because it's an example actually of the limits to adaptation. And although um, we can do a lot and we must do a lot to adapt uh, to climate change, we're also starting to see already in some instances um, that there are limits to adaptation. We can't adapt to any types of climate impacts. 
Um, and that particular example in Zimbabwe is of an irrigation scheme where um, it's helped uh, the local community to deal with more erratic rainfall. But when you get very extreme droughts, the water table drops so low that there is not enough water pressure um, to get water into the, into the system. And it just goes to highlight that in the end, although we must increase our efforts to adapt very rapidly, um, unless we also reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, the levels of, green, of global warming we're going to see will surpass our adaptive capacities um, within the next two, three, four decades. And so it's absolutely critical that we scale up adaptation, but at the same time, we drive down greenhouse gas emissions. That's the only way to protect the poorest people on the planet from going hungry because of climate change. I want to turn to a report released the same day as the IPCC report by the Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change, or NIPCC. The study was funded completely by the Heartland Institute, a think tank that systematically questioned climate change. This is what the report had to say about global warming, quote, a modest warming of the planet will result in a net reduction of human mortality from temperature-related events. More lives are saved by global warming via the the amelioration of cold-related deaths and those lost under excessive heat. Global warming will have a negligible influence on human morbidity and the spread of infectious diseases, a phenomenon observed in virtually all parts of the world, they said. Um, Tim, uh, Tim Gore, can you comment on this pushback, but also talk about the kind of momentum, if there is momentum, leading not just to Peru next year, but the binding summit that will take place in Paris in 2015? The Heartland Institute um, may not be significant in the world, but in the United States, it's part of that force that's trying to prevent uh, any kind of binding action on climate change. Yeah, and, and, and this is, um, you know, goes back to the problem of uh, corporations like Exxon, the, the powerful economic interests that are currently profiting from our high carbon uh, economic model and that stand to lose the most uh, from a uh, transition to, to a low carbon uh, fair uh, alternative. And, um, and you know, that we, we know that when you can track the financing from those groups uh, into uh, groups like the Heartland Institute and others that are lobbying the U.S. government, lo lobbying interests also in Brussels, uh, trying to prevent uh, the European Union from taking more ambitious action on climate change, uh, uh, lobbying in the Australian context as well, um, and are behind many of the more regressive steps that the Australian uh, government has taken uh, on climate change in recent months as well. So this is um, uh, an insidious influence of the fossil fuel industry. We're seeing it in our climate politics all around the world, and it's working directly against the interests of the poorest and the most vulnerable people uh, on the planet who are already being impacted by climate change. And we have to stand up to that. And I think that's why you're seeing um, an increasing movement starting to build, starting to swell with strong roots uh, there in the US uh, around divestment, around starting to say, actually, if we, uh, if we want to get serious about tackling this problem, there's no question of a partnership with some of these energy companies. They, they simply don't have any interest in seeing climate change tackled. Uh, what we have to do is we have to get the money, the investment uh, uh, out of those companies and into cleaner, sustainable, renewable uh, energy alternatives. Salim al we, think... just, we just have 15 seconds. If you could comment from London on that point of where you're going from here. And Michael Oppenheimer, 15 seconds as well. Well, I think, you know, to, to cite the example of the fossil fuel com companies that you mentioned, it's like they are the drug suppliers to the rest of the world who are junkies and are hooked on fossil fuels. But we don't have to remain hooked on fossil fuels. Indeed, we are going to have to cut ourselves off from them if we want to see a real transition and prevent the kinds of temperature rises that I mentioned up to four degrees. The only way is to wean ourselves off the fossil fuels that we use at the moment. But, Professor, I just want to point out, it's not just a problem for the rest of the world. Just think about Hurricane Sandy. Think about how hard it was to deal with that storm. That's today's storms. Think about what happens over the next 10, 20, 30 years when sea level goes up and the storms in all cases, in most cases, get worse. I want to thank you all for being with us. Uh, Michael Oppenheimer and Salim Haq, both uh, co-authors of the newly released Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report. And thank you so much to Tim Gore of Oxfam speaking to us from.